Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Conference Director Lindsay Vereen. Welcome to the Embedded Systems Conference, San Francisco. You may be wondering why we moved a perfectly good conference from San Jose to San Francisco this year. Could have been because we completely ran out of classroom space and there was no way to expand the conference. Could be we completely ran out of booth space and couldn't expand the exhibit program. Could be because we ran out of parking and if you arrived after 7 o'clock in the morning it was hard to get in. Could be because the people coming from out of town couldn't get hotel rooms anymore. All those things are true, but I'll tell you the real reason that we moved to San Francisco. Last fall, one of the conference speakers who happens to live in the United Kingdom was on his way to San Jose, where he was on the technical program. Left Heathrow, arrived in Miami to change planes, picked up another plane. The good news is he arrived in San Jose. The bad news, it was San Jose, Costa Rica. <laughs> he never did make it to the conference and somebody else had to take his classes. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. <laughs> and we also have a keynote speaker who happens to be from the United Kingdom and we wanted this to be an easy target for him as well. Our keynote speaker today, as you know, is the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which started as a BBC radio series in March of 78, it evolved into a series of best-selling novels, actually five novels, a five-novel trilogy. He knows this is wrong and another book is in the works to solve that problem. It's also been a, t a TV series, a record album, a computer game, and there have been several stage adaptations. And currently, it's under development as a major motion picture, which will, is due out, which is due out sometime this century. He says. <laughs> the first novel of the Hitchhiker series entered the Sunday uh, Times bestseller list at number one. The third novel stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for 15 weeks. He sold over 15 million books in the United Kingdom, the US, and Australia. He's also a bestseller in German and Swedish, and there will be a book signing at the CMP Bookstore, booth 2540, right after the uh, keynote today. So ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege, not to say a personal thrill, to introduce you to today's keynote speaker, Douglas Adams. Thank you very much. <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's very good to be here in Northern California, a part of the world so technologically advanced it sometimes even has electricity. <laughs> and there's the odd pocket here and there where you can get reception on your cell phone. You know, at, at Christmas, we went, well, my family, we went to Fiji. We had a wonderful time, scuba diving, sun, everything. One day, we rented a speedboat and we sped across the ocean to the island where they filmed the movie Castaway. It's called Monoriki, and it's the perfect tropical desert island. Sun, white sand, an infinite surround of blue ocean, single rocky hill, clump of palm trees, and perfect cell phone reception. <laughs> Why was the perfect cell phone reception? Apparently, it was in Tom Hanks's contract that there had to be. 
Now what we want to do is try and persuade Tom Hanks to do a road movie on the 101. <laughs> now I'm here to talk about the future. The only thing I can tell you about the future with any confidence is that for the next hour I will be telling you a lot of stuff that will turn out not to be true. I'm exactly as likely as wrong to be, uh, to be, I'm exactly as likely to be wrong as anybody else. Like a lot of people, I've just lost my own brilliant dot-com company. Just like everybody else's brilliant dot-com companies, it was based on the wonderful mathematical notion that if you multiply zero by a sufficiently large number, it'll suddenly turn into something. <laughs> It's an easy mistake to make, like the one that says there's a direct conversion rate between eyeballs and actual dollars and cents. Because once you've spent all your investors' money advertising on someone else's site, and they've spent all their investors' money advertising on your site, eyeballs is all you've got left to pay anyone with. <laughs> Try paying your grocery bill in eyeballs if you're not Anthony Hopkins. Nah, we all make mistakes, and it's especially easy to make the blindingly obvious ones. And none of us can predict the future. Even the computer industry, which is more concerned about the future than most industries on the planet, fail to predict certain key things. Like, for instance, the fact that the century was going to end. <laughs> it also failed to predict the coming of the Internet which now is the computer industry. But I guess we can say that our future is, for a while, going to be dominated by technology. And technology, as Danny Hillis pointed out, is our word for stuff that doesn't work yet. <laughs> and I speak as someone who has, in the last week, spent hours and hours wrestling with AT&T's automated voice response system. Now, many years ago, I wrote a computer game based on The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which, as far as I know, was the first piece of software that deliberately lied to you. <laughs> but it's obviously started a bit of a trend. <laughs> One of the things that AT&T's voice response system continually tells you is that it is there to serve you better. I may not have invented artificial intelligence, but I, maybe I can claim to be the father of artificial mendacity. <laughs> you know the list of great lies? We won't go into them all here, but it's the list that includes the check is in the mail and one size fits all. We can now add a whole new section to that list to include any statement which starts, for your convenience. <laughs> like, for your convenience, we have installed hot air blowers in this bathroom. Or, for your convenience, we have added a 37% service charge to this already outrageous check. <laughs> or, to serve you better, there's another one, to serve you better, we have installed an automated voice response system. It's got to the point that whenever you hear the phrase, to serve you better, you automatically brace yourself. One day we'll hear, to serve you better, we have just launched a nuclear missile attack on your country. <laughs> your responses may be monitored for quality control purposes. <laughs> what do all these phrases mean? They basically mean that this stuff doesn't work yet. The fundamental reason for the sudden chill in the technology sector is that we've promised too much and delivered too little. And for the average user hanging on the end of an analog modem, wrestling to reinstall Windows or trying to get a signal on his cell phone so he can get through to some part of AT&T's accounts department to find out why he's just being cut, out, cut off again when he knows for a fact that it's $50 in credit, he is fed up with being assured by robotic voices that this is all to serve him better. We are stuck with technology when what we want is just stuff that works. How do we recognize something that's still technology? A good clue is if it comes with a manual. A chair, for instance, 
doesn't come with a manual. Unless it's one of those office chairs with levers and locks and tension springs all over it. Like most things designed to enhance your productivity, playing with it all day is much more fun than actually working. <laughs> or perhaps if it comes with a registration card, the way that, for instance, a bunch of flowers doesn't. It'll almost certainly come with a special cable that attaches to something else and requires some installation software that will not run on your machine. It comes with a sheaf of brightly colored leaflets for you to give to the garbage man who in turn buries it in the ground for future generations to grow stuff in. <laughs> if it's a cell phone, one of the things your manual will tell you about is how to spend 17 hours straight programming your telephone numbers into it with a matchstick. <laughs> this despite the fact that you already did this with the last cell phone you bought only six months ago. And despite the fact that what both of these things are is communications devices. And despite the fact that you've already got your names and addresses or telephone numbers on your computer, which is also, guess what, a communications device. Yes, you can make them all communicate with each other, provided you kept the little cable. And provided the cable fits both of your cell phones. And provided the software runs on your computer. And provided you kept the manual and you've got nothing better to do with your life than read it. <laughs> and provided, of course, that the reason you're replacing your old cell phone is not that you've lost the damn thing. Another thing technology comes with is a little dongly thing called a power adapter. Now, electricity is a fairly commonplace item these days, unless you live in California, but <laughs> it comes in more flavors than Hagen dazs Baskin-Robbins, and the iMac put together. And one little dongly thing will not fit another gizmo. I've got cupboards full of power supplies, I probably don't need any more. But the key word here is probably, which is why I daren't throw them away. <laughs> half the little dongly things I've got, I don't even know what gizmo they're for. More importantly, half the gizmos I've got, I don't know where the little dongly thing is. <laughs> which usually means I end up having to buy another one at a price that will physically drive the breath from your body. <laughs> now, why is this? Well, there's one possible theory which is that just as Xerox is really in the business of selling toner cartridges, Sony is really in the business of selling dongly little power supplies. <laughs> Another possible reason is sheer blinding idiocy. It couldn't possibly be that, could it? I mean, it's hard to imagine that some of the mightiest brains on the planet, fueled by some of the finest pizza that money can buy, haven't at some point thought, wouldn't it be easier if you all just standardized on one type of DC power supply? Because that really would be serving the customer better rather than merely claiming to. Unfortunately, the Xerox model is probably the right answer, which is why the in-car hands-free kit for one cell phone will certainly not fit another one, not even a later model from the same manufacturer. Because you don't make money on the phones, but you can make money on the accessories. But the result is, we mostly don't bother with the hands-free kits anymore. We just rear down the highway with the phone clamped to our ear, peering at the tiny screen, and prodding one-handedly at the buttons. Ah, so that's why evolution gave us opposable thumbs. <laughs> on the 101, people race from one pool of reception to another, and then drive as slowly as they can while they're in one, weaving around the road, trying to operate their cell phones with their thumbs. So this is a sales strategy that is not merely inconveniencing its customers, it's actually killing them off. <laughs> All this is just techno litter. What is it doing in the box? Basically, it's there to tell us that this stuff doesn't work yet. What's the difference between a book and an ebook? An ebook comes in a box and a book doesn't. What's in the box? All the stuff that says 
this doesn't work yet. I'm not saying it won't work, quite the reverse. How will we know when it's working? Well, we won't. Because one of the sure signs that something is working is that we don't notice it anymore. Since the coming of the universal ATM machine, traveler's checks have disappeared without our noticing. We just don't notice money as being a problem when we travel anymore. We notice things that don't work. We don't notice things that do. We notice computers. We don't notice pens. We notice e-book readers. We don't notice books. Of course, one of the great things about human beings, though, is that just because something is working pretty well doesn't mean to say we aren't going to tinker with it. The bathroom faucet, for instance. Now, once upon a time, this is a very simple device. You know, you just turn it on and the water comes out. Now, you go into the bathroom in an airport or a hotel or a conference center, and you approach the wash bowl with caution. Do you turn the water on or do you push something? With your hand or your foot or your elbow? Is it meant to come on automatically? Do you have to wave at it? And when you finish, who's responsible for turning it off? You or it? Will it know or do you have to find somebody? Of course, the fact that we continue to fiddle with stuff that already works perfectly well echoes our own nature as evolved beings. Every act of conception is a new throw of the dice, a unique new mix of genes some mixes more successful than others. It's the key to our adaptability. Anything that really is an improvement will tend to proliferate. And we wouldn't have got to it if we hadn't kept reshuffling and making mistakes with stuff that already seemed to be working. There's now a new generation of smarter office chair beginning to arrive, which makes a virtue of doing away with all the knobs and levers. All the springing and bracing we've learned about is still there, but it adjusts to your posture and movement automatically without you having to tell it how to. All right, here's a prediction of the future about you, for you. When we have software that works like that, the world will truly be a better and happier place. As kids, we were fascinated by the future. Unlike most generations before us, we knew for sure that it was going to be different. We just didn't know what it would be. Would there be space travel? Would there be time travel? Comic books showed us pictures of people in crimply in suits with plastic helmets and personal jetpacks. It turns out what they were actually predicting was the existence of the sharper image. Now that we've actually reached 2001, we know we were a little over-optimistic about space travel. Time travel? Well, we haven't invented that yet, but is it possible? There's one view which says that if at some point in the future we do invent a way of traveling back into the past, then we would already know about it now. That's the whole point. Think about it. But I... <laughs> but I have a theory that we do know about it. I believe there are people regularly traveling, but traveling back from the future and interfering with our present lives on a daily basis. The evidence is all around us. I'm talking about every time we make an insurance claim and discover that somehow, mysteriously, the exact thing we're claiming for is now precisely excluded in the wording of your policy. <laughs> Another definition of technology is something we don't understand yet. Everyone in this room is too old to understand our own technology, even or especially those of us who are intimately involved in designing it or thinking about it. One of the mistakes we make is thinking it's important. Only children understand the technology of their parents. They know how trivial it is because they weren't around while we were struggling to invent it. 
When the telephone started out, we didn't know what it was going to be for. One theory was that it was going to be used to alert you that someone was going to be bringing you a telegram. <laughs> the way we now phone people up to tell them we've sent them an email. <laughs> Another theory in England is that it would be how we would receive messages from the king. One thing was for sure, this was an important, dramatic piece of new technology and hence would be used for important, dramatic things. What the next generation realized was that the phone was what, was, was what the phone was best for, was chatting to your friends about nothing very much. And as we know, being good at chatting on about nothing very much is very good for getting laid. And it's hence the main reason why we are all here today in this hotel or this conference center rather than swinging around in trees. So we may not think it's important, but it is at least significant. Now, seeing the way in which different generations respond to technology as it comes along has, in my mind, given rise to a set of rules of technology. It comes from watching my six-year-old daughter growing up in a world of email, cell phones, and DVDs. And I've come up with this set of rules which describes our, technician, uh, our, our reactions to technology. Rule one, anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and just a natural part of the way the world works. Rule two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. Rule three, anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> and the thing is, it takes us a while to understand our new technologies. I, mean, I remember the first time I ever saw a personal computer. It was a Commodore PET. You remember the sort of pyramid-shaped thing with a sort of screen about yay big? I was fascinated by it, but I couldn't see what use it could possibly be for me. After all, I was just a writer, and I didn't have that many things to add up. That was because I had the wrong idea about what a computer was. But so did we all. We thought that the computer was an adding machine, and we developed it as a fancy adding machine with a long feature list. And as computers became more and more powerful, we began to think, well, what else can we make these numbers stand for? Perhaps we can make them stand for the letters of the alphabet, ASCII code. And suddenly we realized how short-sighted we'd been to think the computer was just an adding machine. It was much more exciting than that. It was a much, much more thrilling, extraordinary thing. It was a typewriter. <laughs> and so we developed it as a typewriter with a long feature list. If you're familiar with Microsoft Word, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> then we began to, wonder, began to wonder what else we could make these numbers stand for, like the elements of a colored graphic display, pixels. And again, we were astonished at how short-sighted we had been. The computer wasn't just a typewriter, it, it was a television with a typewriter sat in front of it. And now that we're networking all our computers together, we've come up with yet another insight, the World Wide Web. The computer isn't just a typewriter or a television. Even more exciting than that, it's a brochure. <laughs> what we do to make computers usable is use them to model things we are previously familiar with from the real world, and often we don't realize not to include their limitations as well. Brochures are ways of disseminating carefully controlled and packaged pieces of information. The web is a way of exchanging information peer to peer. Who doesn't understand this? Well, it seems most of us, but let's pick a few examples. BritishAirways.com. This website is a classic brochure. 
If you ask it for flights from London to Los Angeles, it'll only tell you what they want you to know, which is that British Airways runs flight 283 at 12 o'clock and flight 269 at 3 o'clock. But what about United? What about Continental? What about Air New Zealand? What about Virgin? What about American? Don't they do flights? Well, yes, but there are competitors, for heaven's sake. You don't want to fly on those. We don't want you to fly on those. Why on earth would we want to tell you about our competitors' flights? And the answer is, of course, that if British Airways don't tell us about their competitors' flights, there's dozens of other websites, only a couple of click clicks away, that will, including, for instance, United Airlines, who don't fall into this trap. They will happily tell you about all of the available flights. So whose website would you go to for this information? The one that tells you only what they want you to know, or the one that tells you everything you want to know? Let's look at what British Airways loses this way. Traffic to their website, all those delicious eyeballs. <laughs> the opportunity to parade all their wares, special offers, and so on. The chance to at least sell you a ticket, even if it's on their competitor's airline. And the last thing is most important of all. They lose the opportunity to see which flight, when presented with all the choices, you actually choose. To see how well what they're selling stacks up against the competition in a straight fight. How do we know this information is important? Well, because of the sheer number of people they employ to stand around airport carousels with clipboards trying to find out. Why are clipboards useless? Well, present someone with a choice of things to buy, and you'll see very easily what they want. Present someone with a questionnaire or a clipboard, and they lie. A friend of mine once had a job preparing a questionnaire for people to fill in on the web. He said the information they got back was enormously heartening about the state of the world. For instance, did you know that almost 90% of the population are CEOs of their own companies and own over a million dollars a year? <laughs> <clears throat> British Airways have not understood the basic lesson of the web, of the network, that you get really useful information not by demanding it, but by sharing it. Let's think of another website, bmw.com. Now, the last time I went looking to buy a new car, I looked at several sites, including bmw.com. It's a wonderful site. Flash animations, QuickTime VR. The principal information that's there to convey is exactly how sexy their cars look under certain lighting conditions. <laughs> now, I'm not going to deny that this is not terribly important. I'm as keen as anyone that a proper appreciation of BMW metallic blue gets passed down, down, down the germline to future generations. But what about reliability and cost of ownership? What about safety record? How do they handle in the wet? How well do they hold their resale value? Proper grown-up information that we all grudgingly know we ought to check. Well, you won't find any of that there. Not that it isn't available. There are dozens of independent review sites and user sites where you can get all this information from real people who actually own these cars. But not only will, you not, will, not only will they not give you this information on BMW's website, they won't even tell you where you can find it. They're sitting there in the middle of the web pretending that the rest of the web doesn't exist. So the irony is that if you go out into the web looking for information about BMW motor cars, the last place you'll find it is on BMW.com. That's not the way to use this medium. So, is there anybody there who does understand it? Well, Amazon is different. In Britain, we're fond of saying, whether it's true or not, that we have the least bad TV in the world. Well, Amazon is the least unsuccessful retail site on the web. Why? Because it's a community of people. It's built by the people who use it and shaped by how they use it. It's like an ant colony. Everything you do within it adds to or changes the structure of the whole. Or like a forest with freshly fallen snow, your footprints leave tracks for other people to follow until they encounter other people's tracks, all the while leaving tracks of their own. So what you're exploring is created 
not by a few guys in an office in Seattle, but by millions of people buying and reading books and sharing their opinions of them moment by moment. It's worth exploring just for itself, and while you're at it, chances are you'll buy a couple of books. That's, of course, where it all falls down for Amazon, in fact, because then they've got to find them, wrap them up, and send them to you, which costs them a lot of money. <laughs> this has always seemed to me to be a wonderful opportunity for an entre entrepreneur. All you have to do is create an even better website than Amazon, do everything they do right, and improve on it wherever they do something wrong. And when one of your users wants to actually buy something, you pass the order on to Amazon.com. <laughs> Under the terms they currently offer to any other website that generates a sale for them, you get 10% of anything, uh, of, uh, 10% of the value of that sale. And you don't have to build warehouses, you don't have to have anything to do with Simon & Schuster or Random House or UPS or FedEx. It's conceivable, though, that you might one day have to deal with Jeff Bezos' lawyers. Not for a while, though, I think, because they'd have a hell of a time figuring out what they could possibly be say, what they could possibly say. So what's wrong with Amazon that you could improve upon? Well, there's one big flaw, it seems to me, which is a hangover from bricks and mortar retailing, just as the Prasini March was something that used to turn up in early movies till, till smart people began to wonder what it was still doing there. And it's this. Most of the effect you have on Amazon's website is only generated when you actually buy a book or video. That's the moment at which the sales rankings are recalculated. That's the moment at which they make a connection between the, the book you just bought and other books you've bought in the past. That's the moment at which they make a connection between the book you just bought and the books bought by other people who just bought that book, and so on. But what happens if you didn't buy anything? What happens then? Well, nothing, obviously. Do I mean obviously? Think about this. We've all had the experience of going into a shop and saying, that's nice. Have you got it in blue? And they say, no. End of story. Someone else goes in and says, that's nice. Have you got it in blue? And they say, no. No. Someone goes into another branch and says, that's nice, have you got it in blue? And they say, no, no there's no demand for it. <laughs> and they're right, there is no apparent demand for it because they've never ever sold one in blue. And the reason they've never sold one is that they've never made one in blue. And then Apple comes along and makes them in blue and sells them by the truckload. But, um, <laughs> But seriously, in the real bricks and mortar world, if you sell something, you, uh, if you sell something, I'm sorry, but seriously, in the real bricks and mortar world, if you sell something, you know about it. If you don't sell something, you don't know about it. You don't get to find out about all the things you might have sold if only you'd had them to sell. The exact thing happens on websites. If you come looking for something they haven't got, there is a null transaction. Nothing happens. I wanted this movie on DVD, but it's only on VHS. I wanted these jeans on a 36-inch leg, and you only go up to 34. Nothing happens. Uh, and in fact, I'm being slightly unfair to Amazon here. There are now certain selected videos you can ask to be notified about when they become available on the DVD. And they've made a list of the most popular choices. Here's how it goes. One, Star Wars. Two, The Godfather. Three, Star Wars Five, The Empire Strikes Back. Four, Star Wars, Star Wars One, The Phantom Menace. Five, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Six, Star Wars Six, Return of the Jedi, and so on. Do you know what I think? I think that they and the distributors could probably have figured out that list for themselves. But if I go and look for a DVD of the Russian science fiction classic Solaris, or for a DVD of that wonderful comedy, The Gods Must Be Crazy, possibly the funniest movie ever made other than The Life of Brian, <laughs> they don't exist. And there's no box on the video page I can tick to say, that's what I came looking to buy. Why not? Because there's no demand for it. 
that the easiest thing in the world would be to redesign the software so that it made a record of what it was the customer actually came looking for. The reason we don't think to do that was that there was no easy way of doing it in the bricks and mortar, in bricks and mortar shops, and bricks and mortar shops is still the model we're working from. One last observation about Amazon. Paying for books by credit card is very easy. And since they have invented and rather controversially patented one click, they've made buying, buying books about as easy as sliding down an extremely buttery pole into a vat of nice warm chocolate. <laughs> credit cards are fine for buying books and CDs and cameras and watches and sunglasses and so on. And in fact, the invention of computers and modems and software have combined to make it particularly easy to buy things like computers and modems and software, which is a blessing. But credit cards are not so good for things that cost less than, say, $5 or $1. You certainly wouldn't go to use a credit card for something costing 50 cents or 10 cents or a tenth of a cent, and the credit card companies certainly wouldn't like it if you did. How many of you have had the experience I had just the other day? I went to buy a magazine in an airport, only to discover I had zero cash on me. Rather than putting $2.50 on a credit card, I ended up buying a whole bunch of other magazines I didn't really want, just to bump up the price of something I didn't seem embarrassing to slap down plastic for. But think of all the corporations that have managed to make huge businesses out of the fact that you've got a few quarters in your pocket, a couple of bucks. The Coca-Cola Company, the Hearst Corporation, Mars, Starbucks. These are not insignificant businesses. There is no way at the moment, however, of making the scale of transactions that support these giant corporations on the web. It's a dead zone for e-commerce. OK, so maybe Starbucks hasn't figured out a way of delivering a cup of coffee to you over the web yet, anyway. But think again about books and music and the whole debate about intellectual property in general, and Napster in particular. Now, when someone buys a book for, say, 10 bucks, I can't help but notice that what the author gets is about one buck. But when you go to a bookstore to buy a book I've written, what you're actually after, I think, is the story I've created and the precise and, I hope, unique way in which I have written it, i.e. about 100,000 hand-picked words cunningly arranged in a particularly exciting or amusing order. <laughs> they are not going down to the bookstore thinking, hmm, I fancy a bit of wood pulp today. <laughs> and yet that is 90% of what they're paying for. The other $9 goes towards the cost of cutting down pine forests, scrunching them up, smearing them with ink, and packing them into trucks which drive around spraying toxic hydrocarbons over the landscape. It also pays for a lot of very nice people called Caroline who take you out to lunch and tell you how thrilled they are to be working with you. Which is all very fine and large, but it all represents about a 900% markup on my work. I have to tell you that this has got my attention. <laughs> In the music world, it's also got the attention of people like George Michael, David Bowie, and the artist formerly known as the artist formerly known as Prince, or Prince for short. <laughs> for less powerful rock musicians, the proportion of cost of a CD that they actually receive is even more minuscule. But if you agree that all of the traditional costs of manufacturing, delivering, and marketing a CD are now becoming redundant, and that they can and should be removed from the equation, then what you're left with, what the musician gets for each individual song, falls slap bang into that dead zone for which there is no means of paying. And once e-books begin, uh, begin to become usable, the same will go for authors. So what does this mean? It means that there's now a very urgent and pressing need for micropayments, for digital cash, for the ability to say, yes, I'll buy that song for 10 cents. A button on the screen, and it's done. 
No fuss, no complication, no boxes full of techno litter, no sneaky ways in which it all has to be rooted via Redmond in the state of Washington. <laughs> Clean, straightforward, one click and it's done. Now, I'd be happy to sell my books at a dollar or so per, per book, even at one cent per page, if we designed the software and the hardware that way. Piracy would be pointless at those prices and would give a whole new meaning to the term a real page turner. <laughs> How many books have you got 20 pages into and thrown across the room? Only cost you 20 cents, provided, of course, you don't throw it too hard. <laughs> I have to own up to a rather ignoble thought here. When people come up to me and say, oh, Mr. Adams, I do love your book. I've read it 10 times. I smile and say, thank you, thank you, how nice. But there's a bit of me that's thinking, yeah, but you only bought it once, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and once we have a simple one-click method of making micropayments, it means that all those businesses which have gone out of business because zero multiplied by any number you care to name is still zero, will finally have an actual proper old-fashioned revenue stream. The web will no longer be free, it'll merely be cheaper than newspapers, books, CDs, DVD, DVDs, or videos, or all those other media whose expensive substrates, substrates we all take for granted. So it's easy enough to characterize Napster as being a system which allows us uh, to share commercially recorded music with each other without all the tedious business of going down to the record store and actually paying for it. But until we do have digital micropayments, I'm not sure we have the right to call 50 million people who are Napster users thieves, when we haven't even given them the opportunity to pay. The current system is not, as the music companies claim, one in which they are dedicated to protecting the rights of struggling artists. A glance at any struggling artist contract will tell you that. Instead, it is one in which the music companies, or video companies, or film companies, are seeking to protect a business model that is predicated on an extremely expensive substrate, which they have so far controlled, and for which new technological advances are making redundant. Now, when we're each locked in our own private hells, battling our way through AT&T's automated voice response system, I hope you're getting the message here. This has been <laughs> listening to digitized voices telling us that this is for your convenience or to serve us better. It's easy to be haunted by Orwell's big brother nightmare and to feel that we've all become tiny cogs in huge corporate wheels, that we're being bullied, exploited, and patronized by forces over which we have less and less control. But I think exactly the opposite is true. And I think the problems we're going through at the moment are precisely because that old model of technology is thrashing around in its death throes and a new one is rising to take its place. Think about it. Orwell envisioned a totalitarian system that was ruled from above. And so did Thomas Watson the head of IBM, who famously commissioned a study to find out how many computers the world would need. When the study came back with the answer, six, <laughs> he determined that IBM would build them all. But something very different is happening. Instead of one or six big brothers wielding control from the top of a hierarchy of power, we have millions and millions of little brothers and sisters and cousins there are computers for all of us, on our desks, in our homes, in our cars, in our phones, in our TVs, in our pockets. Soon they'll be as plentiful as chairs, then as pieces of paper. Then pieces of paper will be made of molecular supercomputers. They're not power devices, they're information devices, and they go where they're actually useful, which is where the information is, which is where we are. And peer-to-peer -peer networking allows us to share it with our, each other directly. So, there are a lot of us and a lot of computers. They're all handling information all the time and could handle a very great deal more if we had the wit to let them. Let me give you an example. 
There are an enormous number of CDs in the world, creating an entire discography of every CD ever recorded will be a daunting task. But a rather bright company called cddb.com, now, oh, thank goodness, gracenote.com, um, figured out that since people frequently put CDs into their computers, CD-ROM drives, and since computers are often connected to the internet, it would be possible to create such a discography automatically. Any time that any one person happened to get their hands on an absolutely brand new recording, which wasn't in the discography yet, all they had to do was spend two minutes typing up the track listing, and nobody would ever have to do it again. And if they didn't do it, someone else would. It only needed one person to do it, and then anybody who put a copy of that CD into their CD-ROM drive anywhere in the world would be immediately presented with that track listing. It doesn't originate from the CD itself because the CD format was specified before we thought of adding digital information to the tracks. It's come from the shared network which has recognized the CD from the exact number of bytes on it, which, like a fingerprint, happens to be unique. So gracenote.com has a comprehensive discography of every CD recording in the world, which is self-updating. Now that's just CDs. Imagine if every piece of information we ever generated about the world that passed through a computer, whether it's a restaurant owner typing up its menu for the evening, whether it's a shop maintaining its stock list, whether it's a car noticing what speed it's going, how much petrol it's got left, and where the nearest service stations are, and what prices they're charging, or whether it's someone measure, measuring the wingspan of an off African swallow, or writing down where and when their grandmother was born, or whether it's someone taking a digital photograph from the top of the Great Pyramid or the Eiffel Tower, or just of a flower that's bloomed late this year, or early, or the settings on your thermostat when you turned it on or off, or if every time you took your child's temperature, the network remembered. Imagine all of that gradually creating a shared software model of the world. Just imagine. I think we get a much better clue about the way forward by looking, oddly enough, at cars rather than by looking at the current crop of PDAs. A car with a satellite navigation system knows where it is in the world. Now, if you're familiar with this, the effect really is quite startling and remarkable. <laughs> I have, in fact, the first time I, uh, after I'd put satellite navigation in my, um, my, my car, after a few weeks, I happened to notice one day my six-year-old daughter wandering around the garden, pushing her pram, and she was muttering something to herself. And I came up behind her to listen to what she was muttering, and she was saying, proceed to the highlighted route at the next junction. To she was satellite navigating her pram. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's still very, very limited, because unfortunately, the model of the world that the car follows is currently written on a CD-ROM in the trunk where no one can get at it. When cars become IP devices and get their model of the world live from the internet, they will become information sharing devices moving through an information rich world. Now think what happened to desktop computers when we moved from the closed world of CD-ROM to the live open world of the net with its rainforest ecology of programmers devising ever more ingenious ways of sifting and getting it and deploying the information flowing around it. Imagine that happening to cars, which are not merely following information maps of the world, but helping to create them as they do so. For the moment, they're not constrained by power supplies or display size in the way that PDAs are, and they will have a real supply of information to work on. That's where I think our mobile personal informational systems will have a chance to develop and mature. Then, when PDAs are ready and able to deal with that kind of information, to cross-relate who you are, where you are, what you are, and what you want to who everybody else is, where they are, what they're doing, or what they want, and do it seamlessly and transparently, then we'll be getting somewhere. Let's imagine a device like this for a moment. It'll effectively be a window from the real world into the virtual world of information that is mapped onto it. 
In the real world, the most potent and powerful connection between any two objects is physical proximity. In the soft world, it can be any connection that anyone can imagine. In the real world, if you want to know what the view from the top of the Eiffel Tower looks like, you have to go there. In the soft world, you could ask a guide device to show you what it looks like from the top of the Eiffel Tower. Maybe it can show you the view through a web webcam there at the moment. Or maybe it can instantly construct a VR view for you in real time based on everything it knows about everything that can currently be seen from the top of the Eiffel Tower. First thing you see is a lot of virtual graffiti. Some of it quite naughty, being French, so you wave it away. And as you look down at your virtual view, you ask it how many of the cars you can see from your current vantage point are British. For a moment you think, oh, it's not working. <laughs> and you say, okay, how many of them are Citroens? And the view lights up with thousands of moving dots. Okay, how many of the cars you can currently see have some Bach playing on their in-car stereos? A few dozen. Oh, and there's one playing your favorite recording of the Schubler Preludes. Does it have its flag up? Yes, she'll talk to you. But only because the only thing you'd asked her about was what she was listening to. Anything else and her flag would have been down for you. So you chat a bit about the music and you quickly discover a tremendous rapport. What about having dinner together? Okay, but she has a gluten problem, which restricts where she can eat. And you like turbot. A couple of restaurants light up in the view. One of them looks great for a romantic tryst, lots of alcoves and dim lighting. But uh, some of the people who've eaten there tonight have left notes in cyberspace saying that uh, um, they're obviously a bit understaffed in the kitchen tonight and the food has been coming out cold and reheated. The other place gets raves about the food, but it's a bit bright and noisy. You decide that good food is probably the thing to go for. Then you remember, damn, you're not actually in Paris, you're in New Delhi, and got a bit carried away. <laughs> That's all right, says your new friend. I'm actually in Albuquerque. <laughs> I'm a music squatter. What does that mean? Well, she says she just monitors the network for anybody who's looking for someone who's listening to that recording. The real occupant of the car had his flag down and wasn't talking to anybody, so she intercepted your query and really enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> and now she's going, she's going out to dinner locally. Bye-bye. You track which restaurant she's going to and send a margarita to her table to say thanks. But she's annoyed that you tracked her and turns the connection off. Oh well, you go back to your day job, which is erecting advertising hoardings on Mars. Uh, soft Mars, that is, which has recently been added to the soft solar system. It was quite an expensive project because you can't rely on millions of people feeding back millions of snippets of information every day, which is what keeps the soft Earth continually alive and developing around us. i quote my friend, the um, nanotechnologist Brozel Haslacher. He said, the Romans believed that there were little gods in local things like fountains and trees. And that's basically what the world will look like soon because there will be little gods in everything. But it's really just sets of computers lying around in paint or plastics, whatever. But they will be in large functional spaces attached to them. Paint won't be paint. It'll be listening, it'll be recording, it'll be responding, it can be interactive. That's a very confusing world. But one of the things we learn about confusing worlds is that young people get used to them very quickly, and this will happen alarmingly fast. My own way of putting it is that we are participating in a three and a half billion year program to turn dumb matter into smart matter. We, with our brains, are the product of the previous phase, and the builders of the next. Let me finish with a little bit of a story. How much time have we got? This is not strictly relevant, but I want to tell it anyway. <laughs> no, I have a way of making it relevant. And this is a story which is um, something that happened to me. I do want to be absolutely clear that this is something that happened to me because um, it's developed as a, something of a, 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 a kind of a urban myth. And you know what the characteristic of an urban myth is. It's something that happened to your wife's best friend's milkman's cat's veterinarian, and hence, by implication, actually not to a real person at all. Um, but this did actually happen to a real person, and the real person was me. 
I had gone to catch a train. This was um, in April 1976 in Cambridge. That's Cambridge, UK, the original one. <laughs> we didn't think to patent it. Um, <laughs> and I was a bit early for the train. I'd got the time of the train wrong. Well, I think British Rail had got the time of the train wrong, in fact. So I went to get myself a newspaper to do the crossword and went to the cafe and got myself a cup of coffee and a packet of cookies. And I went and sat at a table, and I want you to uh, picture the scene. It's very important you get this very clear in your mind. Here am I, here's the table, uh, newspaper, cup of coffee, packet of cookies. And there's a guy sitting opposite me, perfectly ordinary looking guy, wearing a business suit, carrying a, a briefcase. Didn't look as if he was about to do anything weird. What he did was this, he suddenly leant across, picked up the packet of cookies, tore it open, took one out, netted. it. Now this, I have to say, is the sort of thing that the, the British are very bad at dealing with. <laughs> there is nothing in our background, upbringing, or education that teaches you how to deal with somebody who has, in broad daylight, just stolen one of your cookies. <laughs> I mean, you know what happened if this had been south-central Los Angeles? There would have been very quickly, there would have been gunfire, helicopters coming in, CNN, you know, everything. Um, but in the end, I did uh, what... Um, uh, any red-blooded Englishman would do, and I ignored it. Um, and I stared at the newspaper, took a sip of coffee, tried to do a, a clue in the newspaper, couldn't do anything, so I thought, where am I going to look? What am I going to do? In the end, I thought, there's nothing for it. I'll just have to go for it. And I, trying very hard not to notice that the packet was all already mysteriously open, uh, took out a, a, a cookie myself. Thought, that settled him. Um, <laughs> But it hadn't, because a moment or two later, he did it again. He leaned across, and he took another cookie. And having not mentioned it the first time, it was somehow even harder to raise the subject the second time around. Uh, excuse me, I couldn't help but notice. You know, said, I mean, it doesn't really work. So, uh, I, I, and, uh, so in the end, I just took another one. He took it. We, we went through the whole packet like this. And when I say the whole packet, I mean, there were probably only about eight cookies in the packet, but it felt like a lifetime of cookies we were getting through. <laughs> he took one, I took one, he took one, I ate one. And finally, when we got to the end, he stood up and walked away. He gave me a slight look. We, both, we exchanged meaningful looks. <laughs> and he went away, and I breathed a sigh of relief and sat back. And a moment or two later, my train was announced, so I tossed back the last of my coffee, stood up, picked up the newspaper, and underneath the newspaper uh, were my cookies. <laughs> and, um, The thing I particularly like about this story is, uh, is the sensation that somewhere in England has been wandering around for the last sort of quarter century or so, a perfectly ordinary guy who's had exactly the same story, only he hasn't got the punchline. Um, <laughs> but what's significant about this story to, me, to my mind is it's amazing how much contrary information we can absorb before we realize finally, finally, finally that our world picture is actually wrong. And we've interpreted everything that's come in uh, according to the model we already have. Now, we have an old model. We have an old model that we're struggling to get free of, which is that the world is controlled in a top-down way um, by large hierarchies of control uh, that have power over us. The huge change that's occurring as a result of the proliferation of networked computers that give us all the information we need, where we need it, when we need it, in response to who we are and what we're doing. All of this is turning that model fundamentally upside down. In the same way that Darwin told, turned the whole model of life upside down in, in uh, 1859. We're suddenly emerging into a bottom-up world instead of a top-down world. And that's the fundamental thing that anybody working in this field needs to understand, whether you're a business trying to deal with your customers or whether you're trying to construct the technologies that make all this work. That's the fundamental change that's occurred. And anybody who doesn't understand that, 
who thinks we can still work in the old top-down way of the world is likely to wake up one morning and wonder why it seems that somebody else is eating his cookies. Thank you very much.